I'll just um, share my screen. Lovely. Can people see um, the first slide there? Yeah, it's great. OK, well, um, it's a real privilege um, to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me. And this is an audience that's very, very close to my heart. Um, and so um, in these 40 minutes, we're going to going to explore a bit with you the question of how we can use kind of digital tools uh, to help children's learning, especially children with language and literacy difficulties. And I think I'll kind of set out my general position um, before we start. So I am, I'm a technology optimist. Um, I think technology has great potential, uh, but equally I am, um, I, th I think it still has limitations. Um, I think we still have to be quite cautious uh, and obviously it's interesting giving this talk um, in an era where especially artificial intelligence is having a, in the kind of general headlines is causing a lot of discussion and debate about the, the exact um, affordances and challenges of technology. And we'll, I'll be talking a little bit about artificial intelligence um, in this talk as we go through as well. So we can have a think about that debate as it pertains to um, the populations that we care about. So technology, uh, we all know it's becoming a larger and larger part of our lives. Um, and it's becoming a larger part of educational and therapeutic life as well. And this was really brought into focus um, through, especially with the COVID pandemic, a lot of teaching and learning was uh, really kind of forced um, onto screens, onto devices. And I think, and I'm sure many of you, if you're, whether you're an academic, an educator, um, another professional uh, um, speech and language therapist, pathologist, you will have come up against both um, technology can be helpful to you, um, and then also ways uh, that it just felt a bit limiting um, and not as good as a face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and I, do, I think this is where we are. Learning via digital games can be effective, um, but we do still have, as practitioners and researchers, we still have a lot to learn. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit now about what the, the kind of the evidence behind what we know about uh, digital language and literacy games. Um, and I'm going to frame that in, term, in terms of pros and cons. So some advantages are, well, we know this, digital devices can be, can be very motivating. They can be motivating for children. They can be motivating to us as adults. Um, probably we have a few people here who are very attached to their phones, um, various things on them. So there is a motivation factor, but it is very interesting. I was just reading an article actually about um, the motivation come, is effective up to a limit. Um, and you may have really, you may have noticed this yourself. I, I can think of an example of mine where I, I've been learning Norwegian on Duolingo. Um, and, you know, at first very motivated to do my practice every day. And then when I, if you, I then missed a practice, the owl would send me a little message and it would be crying. And, you know, <laughs> I was like, oh no, I have to practice. But even as, even as someone who learns for a living and loves every aspect of learning, um, so, sometimes um, Duolingo um, wasn't motivating enough and I, I lapsed in my practice. Um, so and the, the research I was just looking at was saying that actually these kind of um, intangible rewards, so, some of the badges and uh, uh, avatar clothes that we can get through digital games, they're initially motivating, but in the long term, then um, they don't work in the same way as more tangible rewards. So it's something to keep, um, keep in mind. I think uh, an advantage of digital games is they seem to be very good for tasks and, and skills that need systematic overlearning. Um, and so this is where a child or, or an adult needs lots of repetitive practice that would become quite boring um, if you're doing it with um, a therapist or a teacher. So they can offer this 
um, consistent feedback uh, to something that you're trying to practice again and again. Um, in my own work, this is pertinent to learning phonics, and this will be something of relevance to some of you. Um, with phonics, you just have to learn those letter sound correspondences. They don't come automatically. Um, and actually, there is evidence that um, apps and technology is quite good for that type of skill. Um, maybe not so good for more complex skills. I'm currently working with an app, app um, company in Canada who, are, who have a really nice um, freely available app for reading comprehension. Um, and we're finding it's just it's with a more complex task, language comprehension, reading comprehension. Um, it's harder to have a rich learning experience um, where children can really learn key skills. Don't think it's necessarily impossible, um, but I think that's harder for us as as designers of technology, uh, these more complex tasks. Another advantage of technology is it, it is available um, anywhere there's internet. Uh, there's some really interesting studies of, uh, especially by there's a professor called Marianne Wolf in the US who's done some really cool studies where she's uh, dropped kind of tablets into Africa uh, um, with solar powered um, huts. Um, and children have just been left with a few apps on the tablet and just, and the, the, the study was, do, will these children learn to read if you just leave them with some apps and a tablet? And there were webcams to watch the children's behavior. And actually they, they, the children became very collaborative and did, did do quite well at teaching themselves to read in that situation. Um, I do think that having uh, teachers and ex experts around is better, but if you don't have anything, then I think technology can be useful. But areas where it really needs to develop um, are, well, firstly, finding apps is, is currently a real challenge, whether you're on um, the internet, uh, the app store or Google Play. And especially with uh, phone or tablet based apps, we have a real issue in terms of finding them because the search algorithms within the apps, within the Apple Store or Google Play, um, you people are typically guided by customer reviews, um, which may, may not be as nerdy as me and, and evaluating on uh, educational quality of pedagogical progression, things like this, may just be uh, reviewing on an initial five minute experience with an app. The other issue is that their tag, the way that um, we can search for these apps is through a keyword search. And some of you may have found this issue where you search for a keyword and then you don't find what you want. Um, and there's an issue here that uh, the keywords are, they're not necessarily associated with the app by um, someone who comes from an educational or clinical background. Um, it may be a designer um, or someone who comes, who works out what the tags are. And so this can make it very difficult to find relevant apps um, just through the basic interfaces, which means we're very much, well, ourselves and our clients and families, um, it's, uh, it's hard to find good apps. And it's, um, at the moment, there's no standard way of, of evaluating these. Um, so I think that that's something that we really need to develop across different, many educational domains. The other big issue, and this is the one I'm going to talk a bit more about, is um, a lot of apps at the moment are, they're a bit stupid, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, and so, I mean, they're, they are, to give them their credit, clever in many ways. So often how an app is designed is, say for phonics, we think about the educational progression. So someone, I'm helping design an app at the moment that's uh, based for UK and Irish children learning literacy. So we're looking at the national curriculum, we're looking at the order that phonics is taught. We're going to we're going to program that into the app, um, and then so children start to play. If they reach a certain level of mastery, um, it gets harder. So that just means the next the next letters appear in the progression that we that we've determined. Um, if a child's struggling, goes down to things that have already been um, uh, shown. So that that's that's good to a degree. But the many apps um, are not programmed so that they can give children constructive feedback 
about what to do kind of if they're making a consistent error uh, an app may not tell them um, what that missing ingredient is that they need to know to be able to um, get that right in the future so it's it's often just kind of correct incorrect kind of feedback this is this is improving and artificial intelligence is helping apps uh, become more nuanced in their feedback but at the moment this is a i think this is a key problem um, because it means well so partly it means that apps remain not as good as a teacher uh, or someone who can provide that corrective um, scaffolded feedback but it also um, it also means that children are unlikely to stick with games because um, for any of us we know that if you're if you're doing an activity and it starts to get either too easy for you or it, you hit a wall and it gets too hard you're, you're going to stop um, and so that's what often I think there's a, that's what happens with a lot of digital games I think the 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 mismatch between what the child knows and where they need to be in the game kind of grows and then the child will give up. Um, so this is something where currently a lot of games aren't so good because it's quite hard to program this in. Um, but we are becoming increasingly able to do this. So I think this is where educational technology uh, is and needs to go as quickly as possible. And what, what needs to happen is that this will happen for mainstream activities, but we these children with language issues who sometimes get well often get overlooked. We need to, we need this technology and these advances filtering through to the areas that we work in as well. So that's some uh, perspectives from research. I'd be really curious um, just to get a sense of um, people in the room and any particular apps um, that you or apps or uh, digital um, software that you are currently using um, to help children learn either language or literacy. Um, so if you just want to feel free, any of you put in the chat um, different tools that you're currently using. Um, and so we can just get a sense in the room um, of the types of things people are familiar with. Also, I can see that Sana is using Grapho Game, and I'm going to talk about Grapho Game in a few minutes. Oh yes, Tara Head Sprout. Yes, that's a good one. Judy uses Simplify. Yeah, that's um, that's a really nice one. I've got a couple there using that. Any other things that people are using? Okay, the Speak and Improve website. Oh, great. Okay, so the Weber Here Builder, Technological Awareness. Oh, they're all flooding in now. Great. Okay, so we've got we've got a range here. <laughs> Suzanne used it. Yeah, I, I've got Duolingo OBC as well. <laughs> um, I think it is good for us to actually try these apps out with our on ourselves or with our families as well, just to see. Um, I think you do get a good sense of how how they work, what they can do, and what they can't do. Um, great. Well, do feel free to keep putting those in. Um, so we've got we've got um, we've got a range here. It looks as if, um, I'm not, but I'm not getting a sense of kind of prolific, um, intensive app use, which is interesting. Um, which is likely to be because actually the area we work in. I mean, there's not many uh, great apps for language at the moment. Um, Fiona, hi Fiona. Oh, you're using Chat GPT. Okay. To, Oh, interesting. So you're writing paragraphs at secondary school that you're trying to beat. I like that. That's great. Um, very good, very good. Okay, so do keep putting ideas up. Uh, I think that's nice for the group as well. Um, 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to zoom in. For, so um, we've got to about 20 minutes. So my second half, I'm going to zoom into some specific work I've been doing, um, digging a bit deeper into what we can do with um, digital data. And so I'm calling this half of the talk uh, Digital Games as Stealth Assessment, which is a term that a researcher in the US called Valerie Shoot uses. Some of you may have seen her work. Um, and so the motivation for this work is that as well as we've got, we've got the side of digital technology where it can be used as a tool for learning, um, but also digital games generate lots of data. Um, and for someone who likes research, um, this, is, this provides uh, lots, lots of possibilities. Um, and so what we have with um, these games is we're, we've got kind of moment by moment um, logging of uh, what, uh, what items children are getting correct or incorrect, how long things are taking them. And so we can really uh, look at the process of learning um, and get this data in, in a way that is harder to do uh, with um, interventions that are paper-based or not, not technological. And it also, a, a real thing that I was interested in, it helps us look at individual differences. Um, so we can, we can give some children a game and then we can look at how do, um, if, if we're talking about readers, which we're gonna do in a minute, how do the stronger readers um, progress through this game? What do we see for the struggling readers? Because um, we can, in theory, really pinpoint the kind of problem areas um, and see what's going on. Um, so for the last few years, I've been digging around in the big data that uh, learning games generate, um, but doing it with a critical eye, because I think you have to be careful with big data. Um, and, and you've probably seen these debates around things like imaging um, and other sets of big data. Uh, you need to be careful that there's a phrase kind of rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, so you need to be careful that you don't just kind of, uh, with so much data, you might find things that are spurious just because of the amount of data you have. So you have to be really careful. And I'm working, um, well, hopefully getting together with um, some other researchers in this area, in the area of re uh, reading games. Uh, so people like Kate Kane, we're, we're hoping to get together and kind of think about what, what certain standards are that we need to, um, think about when looking at this type of data so, so that we're using it ethically um, and sensibly. So I'm going to talk a bit about GrapheGame, um, which I can see that uh, Sana, uh, who's on the call, has used. This, if you're not familiar with GrapheGame, so it's an online platform. It was designed and developed in Finland um, by uh, Professor Heikki Lutinen and team. Um, and so it started as a Finnish um, phonics learning game. Um, but now um, researchers in many countries have translated it into a phonics game across languages. So there is now, there's a US English and a British English version. Uh, there's, I think there's Spanish, there's Norwegian um, and others. So if you're interested, you can, if you Google um, Grapho game, you will, you'll find the website um, and you could see what languages it's available in. I'm focusing in on Grapho game, um, largely because it's a game that um, is very, has a research arm, so it's very open to researchers being able to dig into the data. Um, it doesn't necessarily do its job better than other phonics games, and actually I was, the, the Norwegian team I work with did a, a meta-analysis recently to look at the effectiveness of Grapho game across languages. And it's, it's largely effective. It's not more effective than a teacher. Um, and interestingly, it seems to be uh, most effective when an adult um, is, is lurking around somewhere and supporting play. And this is actually a finding that's coming out with a lot of apps. Um, and um, a student I've been working with this year, actually, on a systematic review, um, Holly Dan, was looking at um, speech sound apps um, and found similar that the, 
the effectiveness um, seems to be better when app use is supported by an adult. Um, so children just using apps completely independently. Um, I think there'll be games to a degree, but having that, that um, intelligent feedback from um, a, a human who knows what they're doing uh, does seem to in, enhance the learning um, gains you can make. So we're gonna talk about some big data that we um, managed to acquire from GraphoGain. Um, so there's a little screenshot here of it. This is actually, you can see this little avatar down at the bottom. This, this is me. <laughs> see my hair's gone very blonde when I'm in this game and my, my clothes choice has gone quite bright. Um, but this gives you a, a kind of idea of what the game looks like. Essentially, children are, they, or, or myself, <laughs> hear, hear a, a sound or a word uh, verbally, and then you're trying to match to the visual equivalent. Um, so in this, in this instance, I think I heard the word dad, and so I would have needed to pop the dad balloon um, in this picture. So the data I'm going to talk about is actually some Norwegian data. Um, so the Norwegian version of Graph Game works in a very similar way. And this is um, uh, with my um, great colleagues in Stavanger. So we had some data from two primary schools um, where we had children at the start of school. So in Norway, children start at the age of six. Um, and children play Graph Game 10, day, 10 minutes a day, four times a week for 25 weeks. Uh, this, is, this is quite a long time. Um, uh, but we were curious to know um, with these children, could we, could we use the data from this gameplay um, to actually predict ha um, how children were doing with their reading at the end of that school year? And we also had some other questions as well. We were interested in, um, those of you in reading research will know that sometimes it can be tricky to have a sense of whether um, someone has um, maybe dyslexia or whether if they come from a multilingual background, um, the, the delays that you're seeing are just the slight delay of, of needing to learn to read in a language that's not your native tongue. So in this project, we had some children where Scandinavian uh, was a second language. And we were also interested in gender. Um, this was because uh, technology use uh, can, can be gendered. Um, there are some, there's definitely in the commercial gaming world, there's certain games that to make gross generalizations, um, boys seem more motivated by. And there is research to show that different types of game design um, can be differently motivating in general um, to different genders. So I, a question we had was, would gender impact uh, an educational game? Um, this was a question we had. We also were, with this group, were lucky enough to, we did some assessments at school entry. Um, and so we also collected some data on and kind of classical risk factors for persistent reading difficulties. So we rank, we gave children a risk index depending on scores on letter knowledge, uh, rapid naming, some phonological awareness tests, um, and also family risk for reading difficulties. Because as with many learning difficulties, um, issues like dyslexia, um, have a uh, familial um, inheritance uh, as, as a risk factor. So these are our participant stats overall. Uh, so we had, a, we had a fairly good gender split, um, a fairly small group who had Scandinavian as a second language. Um, and this was largely just because of the geographical area uh, the data was from. And then a range of risk, of risk points. So yes, yeah, so our questions were, could we use the game data? To what extent does a child's reading risk status, their second language status and their gender explain uh, progress through the game? And if you're interested, uh, you can find the full paper um, following this hyperlink. So it was quite an, a Herculean task to, uh, to dig the data out of these apps. And I would say, if any of you do get a chance to work with an app developer, 
um, which I think I think is something that um, is increasingly happening. Do it's really good to talk to them about what data um, is made easily extractable to you as a user. Um, because we had to go in and, and do lots of, um, well, yeah, talking to the programmer, getting different information out. Um, but in the end, we managed to extract, what we decided to do is at five weekly intervals, um, take data on the, the highest level of the game that children had reached um, in their letter knowledge, their syllable knowledge, and, and their um, word knowledge at the CVC level, consonant, vowel, consonant. This is just a graph to show you what some of the individual play looks like. So really, I'm just showing you this to, to show the diversity of um, kind of play trajectories. Uh, so these aren't grouped in a particular, these are just kind of um, uh, general baskets of play. These aren't factors for those of you um, who have statistical leanings. So you can see that some children um, were, were slow to start and then they kind of found their way into the game and started making progress. Some children just got it from the start and um, uh, made good progress and actually started plateauing in by the end of the, the 25 week period. So we've got all this variability in, in a game that's following a relatively standard progression. So what we were doing is we were using stats to look at, okay, what predicts these different rates and trajectories of progress. And what we found was um, basically gender did not have a role in predicting progress. So whether you were a girl or a boy, you didn't progress through in, in a different um, manner. Whether or not um, you were learning to read in your first language also didn't impact your learning pattern, um, or it didn't make you distinct from the rest of the group. But the number of risk factors for a dyslexic type reading difficulty uh, was highly predictive. Um, this is a, some growth curves that show that the more risk factors you had, um, you, you had a very distinct kind of learning line. And so what we see here is the more risk factors, um, then the, the, the slower your progress through the game. And at first I was really quite depressed about this um, because Grapho game is designed for struggling readers. And I was like, oh no, like if even struggling readers aren't making progress. Um, but then um, my colleagues took me aside and <laughs> said, actually, you know, this isn't too bad because the thing is they are making progress and maybe without the game, um, they wouldn't be. So we, yeah, so we're, see, we're seeing learning, um, but it is at a slower rate um, for the at-risk groups. So this, this was quite exciting. What, what this told us was there is potential to use gameplay data um, to maybe answer some interesting questions we have about learning. Um, and so to summarize this part, so second language status and gender didn't predict game trajectories but at-risk status for reading difficulties um, did. And when we did some additional analysis, actually the game progress predicted uh, reading at the end of the year over and above the early, the, the school entry screening data. So it can be used by itself um, to help us um, predict progress. And that could be useful because it is a game um, you know, we know from many studies that children, even at school entry, are, are sensitive to testing. They know when they're struggling. And um, there's this data that just shows that even, even within the first year of schooling, um, children's perceptions of themselves as a reader um, can be quite negatively shaped already. Um, and so a kind of a way of finding out uh, using both early detection um, in a game like um, context, we felt this could be really valuable. And so we moved on and did a, a more ambitious study. Uh, so we thought, okay, we need more children. Um, but we were also interested in, is there more we could do with the game data? Because what we noticed was um, that as the 25 weeks went on, about two thirds of the way through, some children, um, the amount of kind of episodes of gameplay they were doing in their 10 minutes, they seemed to be doing less and less in the 10 minutes, which, which 
we don't we don't know what was happening they could have just been chatting to their friends because they were in um, small groups or they could have been they could have been in the reward shop the, the game has a, a, a sticker book and you have your little avatar as you saw where you can change your hair color your clothes maybe the kids were just kind of checking out of the learning and spending more time in what we called extracurricular activities and we were also really interested in the types of errors um, children were making could we use types of errors to be even more accurate in our prediction so this is what we're currently doing so we've got a new project called gameplay and so we've been very lucky to be able to collect data from 1,700 Norwegian first graders now. So we've, we've got more data than we know what to do with. We've got 3 million game trials. And if there's researchers here, the, the data is open access. So you're very willing, very um, welcome to help us um, uh, look at this and um, ask some questions about it. This was a bit more um, in the wild. So the guidelines here were playing 10 minutes daily just for five weeks um, and it wasn't so supervised. So it was more, um, yeah, more like a, a real world situation. And then we, what we wanted to do again is we've got external reading tests outside of the game that we can kind of, we can calibrate game progress to. So we've got one set of these, this reading data in and we're gonna have another set next May. So here we use machine learning, which is a is a branch of artificial intelligence. Um, it's a very kind of low key, nothing like chat, chat GPT at all. Very, very gentle <laughs> AI. The reason we used it is um, uh, with traditional statistical techniques. There's often a limit to the number of variables you can include in your prediction models, whereas with machine learning, you can include a lot more variables. Um, so we could look at more stuff um, and we could do it in a statistically sound way. Um, so the questions we had here were, um, so this time without much in it, um, school entry screening, can the gameplay accurately predict um, progress at the end of year one? Here we wanted to ask a bit more about what aspects of gameplay are most predictive of reading difficulties. We got some sense that the rate of progress can be in our last study, but here, as I said, we wanted to look at types of errors, um, out of game behavior. Um, and we also wanted to see if there was information we could give back to the game designers um, from what we were seeing about game progress. So these were our aims. So now we could, we could look at 99 different aspects of gameplay um, to see what was going on for these children. And so we grouped these into categories. We had kind of time on task, things we looked at, accuracy of performance, um, reaction times, and as I said, this kind of sticker book activity. Um, and so with all of this, um, we found that we were able to correctly identify children at risk of difficulties at the end of the school year with about 80% sensitivity. This, this correlates to about the, the best that we have using the more traditional measures of, you know, measuring phonological awareness, um, uh, letter knowledge, our kind of typical assessment um, of early reading. So it's not, at the, it's not better at the moment, um, but it's about the same. So some of you might think, well, what's, what's the point of that then? <laughs> um, and that's a fair question. Um, we do think that because this is a first attempt, we think that machine learning has the potential to get better. Uh, this was, yeah, this, this was us as, as relative novices, seeing what we could do. Um, so I think my, yeah, so my sense is there's, there's value of this. It's, it's not radically you know we shouldn't stop everything we're doing and um, just use gameplay but I think it's got potential and just um, to talk about that whether we saw that particular error types or um, extracurricular activity kind of gave us more information um, we found it did I do realize you won't be able to see this and that's fine I'm just um, I put this up just to I'm going to pull out verbally some of the key points. What we this is the variables that were important in most important in our machine learning models. And so 
at the top, we can see that actually that the amount of um, items the children got correct is the biggest predictor of reading risk. But what's interesting here is that some of the specific errors um, that are coming up is highly important are vowel confusions, and they're very specific ones. These are in the Norwegian language, but it's things like o when u or i when um, or o when o. Um, so I think this could give us some really interesting um, linguistic information about particular predictive errors that we don't have so much in this field so far. And we do also see here that time in the sticker book does rank as a, quite a high predictor of um, risk. So this is showing us that this kind of, um, of what maybe avoidance behavior, procrastination um, is factoring in as a, as a risk, possible risk predictor, which I think is quite interesting. Um, I'm just going to, let's see, just going to say a quick word about the last question we asked, which is about information we can feed back to game designers. So we have here, we did look at some individual learners trajectories. So this is an individual struggling reader. And what you can see here along the bottom is um, time playing the game. And essentially what you're looking at here is um, the the densest, the darker the, the blue is showing the number of times the child's pl done a, played a certain item. And I'm showing you this because it shows that for this struggling reader, that the area highlighted in pink, this child is really, they're not going upwards, which is, which is progress. They're just kind of stuck in a, in a slight kind of, um, uh, imagine a kind of aeroplane in a, um, just kind of trying to wait till it gets onto the runway, um, not really managing to progress. Um, but then in the second half, there is a bit of a spurt. And so we're looking at this because this, this isn't good within a game if the child really is not kind of getting anywhere um, and consistently being given the same items again and again with no real corrective feedback. So this is the kind of thing where researchers, educators and designers could get together and really look at, okay, what's going on here? And how could we help? How can we ch maybe change the design of the game so it helps this kid actually learn, get some success and move forward? So that's another project we're looking at. Okay, so to sum up, so I think overall here, I hope I'm showing you that I think, I think digital learning tools. I think we haven't got many for language learning yet. We, we need more. Uh, literacy, there's a few more, especially for phonics. I think they hold promise for both assessment and intervention for the children that we care about. Um, but I think we do, and I so I think everyone here, we, we still, there's, um, there's quite a lot of responsibility on us to choose something um, that, is going to work effectively. Um, so, it, and because there's not much of a kind of way, a gold standard at the moment, um, whether you're working in research or whether you're a practitioner, um, you, we really need to be doing some action research and just kind of trying to build the evidence base ourselves of what's working, uh, what's not working. And I got a sense of some of that in the chat of people trying things out, which is what we need to be doing. Um, so, yes, I'm going to stop sharing this, the slides for a moment so I can um, see you better, but it would be, um, yeah, I'm really curious about your thoughts um, about the use of technology um, and, yeah, any questions you have about what I've just presented. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jenny, um, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. It, it feels like you you gave us so much in quite a succinct time, which is just quite amazing. And not many people achieve that. And so interesting, so relevant, and so applied for um, you know the children, the adults that we work with. So um, it's lovely. I know we have a lot of people here. Um, if people are happy to um, to show their faces, that would be fantastic. So I can see um, Sarah and Louise, which is wonderful. Lovely to see you 
both, but it's really, really lovely um, because we're going to have the opportunity for some hopefully um, interaction. Uh, Tara has been looking at the chat. Um, can I open it up to questions? And just to say that if you do ask a question, because we're videoing and we're going to be putting the video on the CLTT website and our YouTube channel, we will need to send you a, a consent form um, to make sure you consent for your question and your voice to be on the video. So um, please do ask a, a question, but if you could then just either um, email us or just in the chat, put your, um, your email so we can get hold of you. So who is going to be the first? It's always, Luisha, I'm thinking maybe you're thinking about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put, yeah, great. Hi. Luis, hello, how lovely to see you. Please how go are ahead. you? I'm good, good, please. I, <laughs> I, I was just curious to explore a bit more uh, this, um, this dilemma that you exposed at the beginning between the use of technology versus not using it and the pros and cons. Something that we, me and Vicky explored in, in a therapy setting. Uh, 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 but not so much at home. So if you could let us know a bit more, uh, your thoughts about this. <laughs> okay, um, so so you mean kind of um, co maybe concrete advice on when to use technology? Yes. Yeah. Not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, that's the big question. Well, um, I mean, I, th I, I think it's tricky. I wish there was a, I, I wish I could just give you a kind of like, go to this website and you will get, you know, you can find out um, what apps are effective. Certainly within literacy, for those of you in the literacy domain, the National Literacy Trust um, is a good site to go to. They have some app reviews uh, where they have a fairly nice way of, and I think, you know, evidence-based way of reviewing early literacy apps for children. So that's good. I think in speech and language, um, it's less clear. Um, I mean, I th I, so I think we do have to, I mean, we, I think we just have to put our critical appraisal hats on and we have to, um, we need to look at kind of, okay, um, is the, uh, do, is what they're doing, does it make sense to me in, in terms of what I know about um, speech and language intervention? um and um and then i think yeah i mean it is it i mean i think i think often the a good way to do things is actually looking at user feedback i think um if, if you if you were comfortable with the kind of the pedagogy or the the theory uh, then then the people that you're offering to use the app with will be the ones who tell you whether they, whether they want to use this or not and whether it's motivating so i think yeah i think we all have to be slightly kind of guerrilla researchers here and just um, everything is a slight um, experiment, I think. Thank you. Interesting. Thanks, Jenny. Anybody else? I know we had a lot of people um, telling us the different types of apps they used. Anybody want to um, share any experiences or maybe ask Jenny something about them? And I can, I can see there's a question from Chloe actually um, in the chat. So she, yeah, she's got an unstable internet. So she is asking, it strikes me your gameplay data are providing a form of dynamic assessment. Is that correct? Yes, Chloe, that's exactly what this is. Um, it's dynamic assessment. And what, what I'm really interested in, because we, we kind of, um, we started off, we, uh, I was going to say, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, well, I guess, I guess we didn't fully. We did have, we did have hypotheses, you know, we, we had, there was, was scientific rigor here, but we didn't know how long children needed to play the game for to, to see the prediction. So we started off, as, I, as you saw, with 25 weeks. We then thought, we don't, looking at the growth curves, we thought we don't need this long to do the prediction. So then we moved it down to five weeks, which is what, we, we, which is what we've currently got. And I think that's good for the machine learning. But I think actually, um, again, looking at the data again, I think you could probably just have, there's probably a lot you could learn even from just one, one or two sessions of gameplay. So I think that's, that's the kind of thing we should start looking at. Um, what's, yeah, I mean, how, 
how short and snappy can we can we make this really um, to you? Because this is us looking at kind of theoretical prediction, but as a kind of practical screener, obviously, um, I mean, you, you could have children playing it. And in Oslo, that's what's happening. They're playing it for over a few weeks, but um, I'm sure therapists and teachers would also like to have a kind of quick snapshots possibility as well. Um, and, Cla and Chloe, just, as, just to finish, are the data easy for teachers to access? Um, some data is, um, but we did have to work with the Grafo game designers um, who were very great. Um, and they, um, they have worked on, they're working with us actually to make a teacher dashboard at the moment where it becomes even easier. So at the moment, Grafo game is not super accessible, um, but it is possible to work with people like Grafo game to get better. And that's key because I think what we realized is we were showing teachers reaction times, um, but that's not necessarily very, it, it's, easy, it's easy data to come out of log data, but it's not necessarily the thing that actually is useful about learning. And then if, if an educator or a parent thinks, right, the child has to get quicker, um, that really could be quite counterproductive. So I think, I think we, do, we need a whole load of learning analytic people to really be looking at, okay, what data is gonna be most helpful to change to help teachers and clinicians know what behavior to focus on. Because um, you must all know, I mean, I've got one of these sports watches and it's often telling me, it's giving me data about like my body battery and things I don't know what they are. And then, you, you know, you could start thinking, oh, well, I need to change this in my daily routine when <laughs> there's no real evidence about behind what it does. So just as Garmin needs to be careful, um, we do too. Right. Thanks, Chloe. And, and, and thanks, Jenny. Um, Sarah. Thanks, Vicky. Um, Jenny, thank you for a really super talk. I loved um, how you you drilled down and you showed us some data from one child and yes. you looked at the flat line and then the um, curve. And I, I'm curious to know how much of that data do you have? And I... Uh, we're all really interested. What happens when does it, when does when does that little airplane take flight, and what happened, and what stage, and I yes. wonder what it was, and over what period of time, and is it a sort of a function of time? You know, the, the nails are growing, the hair is growing, their phonological <laughs> awareness is growing. Do you know what I mean? A function of time is oh, we should have just waited, um, and and the reflection I also am curious about is the um, the time trajectory of the um, instructional. Um, intent and content in Scandinavian countries compared to I'm based in the US now versus London. I'm really curious if you have any thoughts on that big melting pot of questions I have. Yes, yes. OK, so instructionally, Nor Norway at least is not very different from the UK or the US. Um, so I think the, the progression, the kind of rate of progression, I think, in the countries varies. Um, but the, the, the logic of the progression doesn't vary very much. Um, and Norwegian is um, it's a Germanic language that so it has similar kind of um, phonological progression. In terms of the uh, the different readers, so a PhD student um, called Morton, this, so his PhD was actually looking at these individuals. So for I mean for all of our data, we can pull these out, um, but it, it is quite painstaking. So Morton has just written a paper that we that will hopefully be published in the Journal of um, Learning Analytics. The, the journal for the so solar, uh, where we where we show some different trajectories. Because I showed you one there, but we also, uh, when you look at a, a kind of able reader, um, they don't they just kind of, they spurt and spurt, and then actually you can see at the end that they've reached their ceiling. But the game kind of isn't telling them that they've that I I, I one one thing I wanted to feed back to Graph again is you need to tell people when the kid has reached the ceiling because they need to stop playing and do something else. Because you could see this kid just she's just being presented with the same thing and, and she won't be learning anything new at that point. Um, but she's she's stuck in a in a different type of cycle. Um, so we we're we're trying to we're wondering we're not um, how to interpret these kind of fits and starts. Um, because they do look different for different children. Um, and the problem is some of it, will, well, the, the issue is some of it will be about the child, but then some of it will be the game's algorithm. Um, so some of it could be a problem with the game in terms of, uh, 
kind of the the progression it's presenting um so we're so what what Morton tr is trying to do in this article is unpick kind of because I think a lot of research in games at the moment is often you know pre 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 data post data give them the game see what happens whereas actually the games that they're not inert things they every single design decision that someone who may not be an educator has made will impact that child's learning trajectory. So, I mean, it's just so much to do here, um, but we can keep in touch and I can certainly send you um, the, the uh, Morton's article when it's hopefully comes through. Thanks, I'll look out for that. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, I, I, I don't know if there's anyone else. I, I wonder what you might advise a head teacher at a school who you know has a has a certain budget and you know um, what what perhaps to purchase or how to manage you know the, the the number of apps that are just coming as fast as can be. Well, um, I mean, I have um, I work with a I work quite closely with a school in Barnsley um, where they they very much integrated technology into a lot of what they do as a school. And so, I mean, what what they've done is they have a they have a highly a highly specialist teaching assistant whose role is um, around technology. So she um, she goes to conferences, she trials apps with teachers, with the children. Um, she looks out for where there's evidence. She she helped us with um, uh, a European study I was involved with, looking at reading fluency apps. So I think it's. Um, I think in a way, if you can, I think a school, I mean, it does need someone to have, to be kind of taking that role of really scanning, scanning yeah. the horizons. Um, because I think you, we can't expect every individual teacher to be, and it's like you say, for any of us as individuals, it's just really hard. It's changing all the time. Um, and the quality control side of things is, is yeah. really tough. So I think any, I think, if people can find, you know, you, in many organisations, there's people that just love technology and are kind of inclined towards looking for the new best things. I think it's really tapping into them and giving them the resources to both do kind of in school action research, but then also um, being able to try and find evidence where where it's available. But it's it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it is, and it's just coming thick and fast right but it's interesting how it's hard but at the same time there are real positives aren't there you know just well, such positives and I love that that's what your talk focused on you know what yeah, we can no, there's do really, real potential brilliant brilliant I think maybe I'm looking at Judy on that kind of note that wonderful potential and um, perhaps we we brought in and I do, I do have to um admit something quite I mean I think I can't believe that we actually did it um, but a, a colleague of mine and um, I see Sai is here from from the division but hopefully the colleague isn't we just got a, um, a, a research grant looking at an um, apps in um, aphasia and but that's not what I want to say what I want to say is we, the feedback we got back was that we needed to rewrite the the um, English the summary because it was not simple enough and so literally another colleague and it was completely him nothing to do with me he put it through chat GPT and it came out looking really 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 good so I can't believe I've, I've done that but that th there it is the no, positive no. No, we need to we need to admit these things. I think um, chat GPT is not going away. And again, we need to work. And like as, as Fiona was in the chat was saying, um, we need to learn how to work with it. Um, Absolutely. I've, I've worked with some children with dyslexia with it already, and they love it yeah. um, because it's give. And so I've been testing it out, and it does. It gives you a really nice frame for writing. You know, it gives you the topic and an answer. Then it gives you backup points. Then it gives you a conclusion. There is, yeah, 
I mean, there's, there's horrible risks involved, but there are also positives. <laughs> Absolutely. And for those of us working in HEI, maybe it means less essays, which is not a good, not a bad thing, I, <laughs> I, I think. But but Jenny, what an, what an absolute joy um, to, to have such a, um, you, you know, a, a, a rigorous, but also such an applied um, presentation and so wonderfully interactive. Um, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Could I ask everybody um, to, um, again, put their hands together? We've got Sai saying, couldn't agree more. We need more um, talks like this. Absolutely fantastic. I think that's exactly what child language teaching and therapy is about. For those of you who don't know it, it's about um, applied work for teachers and speech and language therapists um, helping to support and enhance the lives, the language, the communication of children and young people with speech, language and communication needs. So if you, if you don't know about CLTT, please go on the website. We're published by SAGE. We're always looking for public for people to write for us. So um, we will be speaking to Jenny and seeing if we can put this into a paper. Jenny, if you're okay with this, we'll put you the video of the talk on our um, website and Tara will look um, into that for us. And um, we're always looking for people to review as well. So please get in touch. And from, um, uh, you know, on behalf of, of Judy, um, the co-editor and all of our associate deans, again, Jenny, thank you so much. Thank you all of you for attending. And um, I don't know, have a safe journey home, I would normally say. So have a safe journey to your kitchens and enjoy your dinner. But God bless and thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, no, pleasure. Thanks, Jenny. That's great. Really good.